welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your SETI, weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today, we're uh, very fortunate to be joined by Alyssa Roden, who's come down to us from UC Berkeley, uh, where she's uh, currently a PhD student uh, studying with Michael Manga, and she's studying on uh, Europa and uh, looking at uh, uh, the dynamic uh, evolution of ice and uh, inner structure of the planet, oh, sorry, the satellite of Europa which we'll hear about today during her talk. Uh, she's a graduate of University of Arizona where she uh, worked with Rick Green, Greenwood, Greenberg. Greenberg, excuse me, and uh, she, uh, she, where she was also working on Europa. So it's a continuing love for her, and I'm sure that'll come through in uh, today's talk. So if you'll join me in welcoming Alyssa. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to be here today. Um, and thank you, of course, for, for coming. Uh, it would be a really lonely talk if I just spoke to a bunch of chairs, so thank you for that. Um, so uh, as Adrian mentioned, I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley in the Earth and Planetary Science Department. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge my collaborators on the projects that you're going to hear about today. Uh, my advisors, Michael Manga and Mark Richards, who are both in my department. Uh, Burkhard Militzer, another faculty member of my department, uh, who helped with a lot of the, the numerical methods. Um, Eric Huff is actually a graduate student at Berkeley. Um, Terry Herford at NASA Goddard. Um, it's been an integral part of this project, and it's his birthday today. So, happy birthday to Terry. And finally, Gilad Worman uh, was a grad student <coughs> in my department and has since moved on to bigger and better things, uh, predicting earthquakes. And finally, I need to thank Penguin Computing for their supercomputer resources. Okay, so this is a great mosaic of surface features we see on Europa. And uh, we see lots of unique structures. Um, these interesting looking faults with their ridges. Uh, this arcuate feature here, which is a cycloid, which you're going to hear a lot more about throughout this talk. Um, disrupted terrain, puddles, um, and these really uh, unique impact structures. And when we look under the surface of Europa, things don't get any less interesting. Europa uh, is covered by a layer of ice and water that's 80 to 200 kilometers thick. And the structure of this layer is, is quite heavily debated, um, and two pre prevailing hypotheses have come out of this. Um, the first is in this bottom cartoon, where you have a thin elastic ice shell overlying a very thick global ocean. The other uh, hypothesis is that you do have an elastic shell, but it actually overlies warm uh, ice, and then just a little bit of, of water at the bottom. And when we zoom outward to look at Europa's orbit, we find this really unique configuration. Um, Ganymede, Europa, and Io, three of Jupiter's large moons, are in an orbital resonance. And what you can see in this little animation is that right here, Io and Europa line up. There they go. And on the other side, Europa and Ganymede line up. And this uh, configuration actually keeps the orbit of Europa from circularizing. So Europa's eccentric orbit actually causes the uh, magnitude and direction of the tidal bulges raised by Jupiter to change throughout an orbit. And so it, in this cartoon, we're looking at Jupiter from the perspective of Europa. And you can see that when Europa is at pericenter, Jupiter appears to be closer and directly sort of along the line. However, as Europa moves through its orbit, Jupiter appears to move in Europa's sky such that the magnitude and direction of the tidal bulge changes throughout a day. And these changes in tidal shape actually lead to changes in tidal stress on the surface. Um, and that daily varying tidal stress has been linked to the formation of tectonic surface features. And so in Europa, we have this really unique laboratory uh, because we have an orbit, interior, and surface processes that are all linked through tides. And this has led to the motivating questions of my thesis, um, which are, can Europa's tidal tectonic features uh, constrain rotational parameters that we cannot directly measure? If so, what is Europa's rotation state? How do tectonic features form within an icy shell like the surface of Europa? And finally, how does our understanding of Europa help us understand other ice-covered moons like the now famous Enceladus? So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about today is how I use cycloids um, to test tidal models and constrain Europa's rotation state. So these wonderful features are called cycloids. They're these arcuate chains going all the way across the surface. 
This is one of my favorite images of Europa, actually, because over here is the limb of Europa. And here is this lovely cycloidal arc coming through the image. And cycloids have been interpreted as, ten as tensile fractures, and their curvature is thought to reflect the daily changes in magnitude and direction of tidal stress due to Europa's eccentric orbit. So in more schematic form, we see here uh, longitude versus latitude. And then these arrows indicate the tidal stress, the maximum tensile tidal stress at that time and location on Europa. And so when we model cycloids, we hypothesize that they're going to propagate perpendicular to the direction of maximum tension, which is those arrows. And you can see that as, as this crack propagates through the stress field, the direction at which it would want to propagate is changing. And so you get this curvature. Um, then at some point in the orbit, the stress becomes so low that you can no longer continue to propagate a crack. And the crack becomes dormant. But the stress field isn't dormant. The stress field is still sort of changing in magnitude and direction. And so the next day, when the stress increases again, you can reinitiate cracking. It's at a different direction than it was when it stopped. And that creates this cusp structure. And so um, every European day, as Europa moves through its orbit, you create one of these arcs. And then subsequently, uh, you can build ridges along them by an as yet unknown process. Um, and there have been some revisions to this model. Uh, but in general, the model has stayed the same. Uh, and it tells us that cycloid paths depend on the spatial and temporal changes in tidal stress, the propagation speed of the crack, how quickly it moves through the stress field, and also the ice strength, when the crack begins, begins to propagate and when it stops propagating. So here's where we get a little bit more technical. Uh, in order to determine what the tidal stress is on Europa, we use the equations for a thin elastic shell. And here, thin is just relative to the actual radius of Europa. So you could still have quite a thick ice shell and have these apply. Um, and so here, we have sigma theta stress, which is in the direction of the tidal bulge, and the sigma phi stress, which is perpendicular to that. And in both these cases, you see that the stress is mainly dependent on this theta, which is the distance to the static tidal bulge. Uh, so if you're at a location on Europa, a specific latitude and longitude, you can trace out the distance between where you're sitting and where the tidal bulge is located. And that's what that theta is. And these equations tell us the primary tidal bulge, so the average bulge raised on Europa by Jupiter as it moves through its orbit. Of course, we know that Europa has an eccentric orbit, and that's what's actually causing stress, pulling it away from that primary tidal shape. And so we need to get a little bit more uh, yeah, complex. <laughs> um, so now we've added a term, this term here, uh, which basically accounts for the change throughout the day in the distance between Europa and Jupiter. Um, and the other thing that changes is this theta is now time dependent because the, the location of the tidal bulge is changing in longitude throughout the day. And so when you make that calculation of how far away am I from the bulge, you kind of have to know where the bulge is. And then the last step is that this equation for stresses also includes the primary tide. And we assume that Europa has long since adopted its primary tidal shape. So, so the final step is to subtract out the, tide, the stress that would be generated from the primary tide from the total tide. So we take these values and we subtract, them, subtract out these values. And what this gives us is this lovely animation showing how stress changes on Europa throughout a day. So we have longitude on, on the x-axis. We have latitude on the y-axis. And what you can see here is if you zoomed in on one location on Europa, you would see how the direction and magnitude of the tension and compression change throughout a day. And it's these changes that enable a, a fracture, if it's propagating through, to have that very interesting cycloidal shape. So we've used tidal stresses to <coughs> model cycloids. Uh, this has been done for four cycloids in the southern hemisphere. Um, and while they were able to fit the general trends of cycloids with this model, uh, in order to get a really good fit, you required many, many, many free parameters, up to 27 free parameters for one fit. The way you get 27 is that, uh, in addition to sort of your generic parameters, um, the starting stress, stopping stress, and speed were varied for each arc of each cycloid. So for a three-arc cycloid, you would have nine free parameters um, just for the mechanical parameters. Uh, so 
I won't say whether or not that's a good thing, but certainly if you can fit something as well with fewer parameters, we think that's better. Um, all of the fits that have been done required longitude translation, meaning you had to move the cycloid after it was formed to its current location. Uh, and that is an indication of non-synchronous rotation of the surface. And there was also some indication that stress builds up from the rotation of the surface and that that is indicated by cycloid shapes. Um, these models could not reproduce equatorial cycloids, and I'll show you why that is uh, in just a moment. And also, they search parameter space by hand and determine the goodness of fit by eye, which in addition to being subjective, um, also makes it impossible to do error analysis on the fits. So I've taken a new approach to cycloid modeling, with the goal being, again, to characterize and constrain, constrain Europa's rotation state. Um, mainly, I tested many more uh, tidal models that include things like obliquity, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. And I also applied it to many more cycloids, including those pesky equatorial cycloids that you can't fit with the generic model. Um, I also developed a more robust methodology for doing this, which includes quantifying the goodness of fit, um, automating parameter searching, and those two things allow us to, to uh, add error bars to our parameter values. When we get an answer, we know how likely the answer is to be, uh, to be correct. Um, this also allows us to test the significance of getting a better fit by adding more parameters. And we decided to restrict the degrees of freedom by using only one set of mechanical parameters for each cycloid. So some of the things that we've added to the model, the tidal uh, effects. The first is obliquity. Um, Bruce Bills in 2005 showed that the inclinations of large satellites, so the tilt of their uh, orbits, um, could actually force the obliquities of those satellites to be non-negligible. For Europa, the average obliquity would be 0.1 to 1 degree, with 1 degree being for your a Europa with a global ocean. Uh, the magnitude of the obliquity is expected to vary on time scales of 10 to 1,000 years, so definitely relevant for geologic processes. Um, the spin pole direction, so, so you tilt the spin pole in the direction that it points, uh, may precess uh, by 0.2 to 2 degrees per day. And we know that the obli obliquity is likely less than a few degrees from gravity data, but we don't really have a good upper limit on what, uh, what the obliquity is. And finally, the tidal bulge would librate in latitude about the equator if there's an obliquity. So uh, eccentricity makes the bulge kind of do this, and obliquity makes the bulge do this. And just to get an idea of how that works, we have this fi figure which doesn't show up very well here. These are contours of the maximum tidal stress uh, at two points in Europa's orbit, at Peri's center when it's closest, and at Apo center with it, when it's furthest away, uh, for no obliquity, and for obliquity with one degree. And mainly what I want you to get out of this figure is that when you add obliquity, you start to break symmetries in latitude. So here, across the equator, sort of mirrored. Uh, in this case, it's, not, it's no longer mirrored. So when we first started thinking about obliquity, uh, we looked at how obliquity would affect global cycloid patterns before we start you know, fitting individual faults. And this is a region called the wedges. Um, and these boxy things are actually considered cycloids. Um, and there's a similar re region about 180 degrees away uh, from this area. And so we wanted to look at um, the wedges and, and what it could tell us about obliquity. So these are hypothetical cycloids. We picked some generic mechanical parameters. We built some cycloids on a latitude longitude grid and we let them go. And what we see is that we do actually generate regions of boxy looking cycloids. Um, however, they're right on the equator. And the ones that we observe, one is actually a little bit lower than the equator, and the other is actually a bit higher than the equator. So this isn't quite matching. And another thing to notice, I had mentioned that uh, equatorial cycloids are hard to fit. And that's because if you look here, the only time they cross the equator, they're going absolutely perpendicular across the equator. Um, Otherwise, they go parallel to the equator. So we don't get nice, arcuate things kind of bouncing across the equator. When we add obliquity, we offset these regions. So now this boxy region is lower than the equator. This boxy region is higher than the equator. And that actually does fit with our observations. Um, in addition, there are those nice, arcuate cyclades crossing the equator like it was not even there. And here they cross as well. And so we kind of took this as the first observational indication that obliquity is important for cycloid formation. So I mentioned non-synchronous rotation before. Um, 
there's a lot of theoretical support for non-synchronous rotation, which is the idea that uh, Europa rotates slightly faster than synchronous um, due to its eccentricity. And this would manifest itself as an eastward migration of the surface relative to the direction of Jupiter. Um, Goldark and Mitchell recently showed that the stress accumulation from the surface rotating around might be very limited, uh, but the rotation could still occur. Uh, some people look for direct observation of non-synchronous rotation by looking at images in Voyager and Galileo, looking at the same features and saying, well, have they moved? And uh, they didn't find any rotation. So within the errors of their measurements, they determined the rotation has to be less than half a degree in 17 years, which would be a period of greater than 12,000 years. Obviously not something we're going to see uh, on a daily basis on Europa. Now, we would expect to see a signal of non-synchronous rotation within our tidal tectonic features. Um, however, that's not worked out as well as we would like. First, the predicted systematic variation in lineament azimuths was not observed. Lineament azimuths change randomly. Um, global scale lineament patterns are also inconclusive. And that basically leaves the mismatch between the observed cycloids and the predicted cycloid shapes as our only real geologic evidence of non-synchronous rotation. The Last thing that I wanted to mention that we tested was physical libration. So I mentioned that uh, eccentricity will cause a longitudinal libration of the bulge about some reference point on Europa. And a physical libration is actually the libration of that reference point. And so that reference point could move with the eccentricity bulge or it could move out of phase with the eccentricity bulge. Um, and Bills et al. computed that the libration amplitude should be small. Um, as much as half a degree, again, if we have an ocean. Uh, and the physical libration, as I said, may be in phase or out of phase with the eccentricity libration. OK, so getting to what I actually did, uh, these are all the tidal models that I tested using cycloids. Um, they all include eccentricity. Uh, the first is actually eccentricity only. And then uh, I added more effects. So first, stress from non-synchronous rotation, obliquity, obliquity along with non-synchronous rotation, uh, fast precession, physical libration, and then the kitchen sink model, or the everything but the kitchen sink model, um, which includes obliquity, fast precession, and physical libration. And then even in models that don't include stress from non-synchronous rotation, we still allow the longitude, the formation longitude to vary. OK, so the parameters that we searched over, um, every model included the formation longitude, as I said, uh, the propagation speed of the crack, and the initiation threshold and propagation threshold, which basically means the starting stress and the stopping stress of the crack. And then for models that include non-synchronous rotation stress, we have the amount of stress, basically. Uh, for obliquity, we get two um, parameters, the magnitude and the direction of the spin pole. For precession, we have uh, the rate of precession, and then the libration has both an amplitude and a phase. Now, it's interesting because without obliquity, with just the eccentricity only model, you can actually look at a cycloid and just from its shape determine whether it propagated from east to west or from west to east. It's very handy. When you add obliquity, that symmetry is broken. So you can't, you can't use that rule anymore. And so we have to actually do both propagation directions in any case that includes obliquity. So we set the propagation direction at the start of each simulation and we do both. Um, and so just to get an idea of what, what this means for our parameter space, the eccentricity only model has four free parameters. That's our smallest model. And the everything but the kitchen sink model has nine free parameters. All right, so here are the cycloids that we decided to look at. Um, Sidon here, Delphi is this guy here, and Silesia. Those are three features that have actually been modeled in the past. So they're good <laughs> reference points. And then it's a little hard to see here, but these are the equatorial features we picked out. This very, very long feature, which actually crosses the equator. Uh, this smaller feature here, which is also nearly equatorial. And then this feature, which you may recognize from some of the earlier figures that I showed. So these are the features that we want to fit. So how the heck do we do that? Well, we have to teach the computer how to build a cycloid. And so the way that we do this is we first select a starting location, a time, and a propagation direction for our fault. Then we calculate the tidal stress and determine the direction of maximum tension. Uh, and then we ask the question, is the stress greater than the threshold? Can this crack actually propagate at the stress? If the answer is yes, then we advance a distance, which is determined by the speed of the crack and the time interval over which we're doing the simulation. 
Um, and then we have two ways of stopping the simulation. One is if the number of arcs that we've built is equal to the number of arcs of the observed cycloid. The other way is if the actual length of the crack is equal to the observed length. If, if either of those are true, then we're done. If not, we increment time and ask the same question again, calculate stress, is the stress high enough? Now, if the stress is not high enough, we ask a different question, which is how long have we been stopped? If we've, only, if we've been stopped less than one orbit, then we're probably making a cusp. And so we have to just increment time until the stress goes back up and we build another. Um, however, if we've gone more than an orbit and the, the crack has not restarted, then it's never going to restart and we're done. Okay, so the next step is to quantify goodness of fit. And so here I'm actually showing uh, the black data points, which are the observed uh, data, and the red line, which is our model fit. Um, so the first thing that we do is we take uh, our data and we translate it in longitude so that both the model and the data points start at the same location. In this case, that's right over here. Then we calculate the arc length from the starting point to each data point. So how far is it along this curve from the starting point to, say, this point? And then, because we have thousands more uh, model points than data points, we actually interpolate along the model curve to the same length of arc as our data point, which maybe is right here. And then we look at the distance between those two points. Um, and we can use just a generic calculation uh, to get um, an, an error estimate, and then divide by the number of data points to get our reduced chi-squared. Okay, so next we need to identify good fits, which means searching the parameter space. There are lots of ways to do this. The most obvious would be a brute force. You know, you pick a grid within each of your, your parameter spaces, and you just test a whole bunch of them. Um, unfortunately, with as many as nine free parameters, that's really not feasible. So we have to be a little bit more careful about this. Um, another way of doing this is with Monte Carlo al algorithms, which is essentially a random walk. You try to sort of follow a good path in parameter space to get to uh, a minimum in chi-squared. Uh, and then there's actually a lot of numerical methods for minimization, where you start at a random location, you try and follow a trajectory that reduces the chi-squared, and hopefully you identify a global minimum in the fitness landscape. And so this. Uh, image here shows kind of what we're talking about. If you had the best fit there at the bottom and you started somewhere on, on this hill, your numerical method would hopefully bring you down into that well. And I, I got this from wishingwell.com and really I wish it worked that well. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, in our parameter space, if you change values by a teeny, teeny amount, you actually make no fault at all. And so an example of this is if you change the obliquity value by a teeny amount, your stress goes down and suddenly you can't form anything. And so this actually leads to infinite walls and shallow wells. So instead of this nice wishing well, uh, our fitness landscape looks more like this. <laughs> and if you drop a ball randomly in this thing, it is very unlikely that it's gonna roll to the global minimum. So the way we dealt with this uh, was by combining several numerical methods. So we do start with a random set of parameter values. And so here I'm just showing, this is just one parameter, of course, we have as many as nine, versus chi-squared. So if we picked a random set of parameter values, it might put us here. And then we employ something called the conjugate, conjugate gradient method uh, to find the local minimum. So basically we're going down slope in chi-squared space. And so now our, our little guy might, might be here. Um, and then we use Markov chain Monte Carlo to explore just the local fitness landscape. Now in this case, it's not going to do much for us. There's this hill right here, and that's going to pretty much keep us, keep the simulation from running down into this region. Uh, but if our random set had started us here, the Markov chain might actually get us over this cliff, and we'd end up here. But in either case, we're stuck in a local minimum. Uh, so once we've done these first uh, steps, we then do employ a grid, a brute force method, over one, two, or three parameters, which is very limited, but still allows us uh, to look for other regions that are disconnected, like this region. Um, and so hopefully that gets us maybe here, and then we repeat these steps until we get our little guy all the way down to the bottom. Um, unfortunately, even with these combined methods, we still often get stuck in local minimum. Um, and so in order to tackle that problem, we basically repeat the simulation for 500 different random sets of starting parameters. 
uh, and that's for each cycloid, each propagation direction, and each tidal model. And that gives us a total of 36,000 simulations, each of which could take anywhere from an hour to a day to run. Um, so thank you, Penguin Computing, <laughs> for getting that done for me. So what do we get? Well, with the eccentricity-only model, we kind of get the same thing that people have gotten before, which is that, again, our data is in black, and the red line is our, our model. We get that we kind of follow the general trend of these cycloids, but we don't really get the details. And then if we add obliquity, we actually start to do much, much better. We're now we're, we are really getting the shapes. Our cusps are in kind of the right place. And then when we add physical libration on top of that, we get even better fits. But what about those pesky equatorial cycloids? Well, here are the best fits with eccentricity. And just as I advertised, uh, without, with only eccentricity, you only cross the equator going perpendicular unlike the shape that we see in EQ1. Uh, and these other guys obviously fit very poorly. When we add obliquity, we start to get something much better, which include arcs that cross right through the equator. And then when we actually add physical libration on top of that, keep an eye on EQ2, we get a much better fit. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Four years of my life for this plot. <laughs> So what do we get in terms of numbers? Um, so here I'm showing the chi-squared uh, of the best fit which e with each of these three models that I showed you. Um, and it doesn't matter that you, re you know, remember these numbers, but just that you notice uh, that they go down by about an order of magnitude when you go from the eccentricity only model to the obliquity model. And in some cases they go down by another order of magnitude when you add libration. And because we've done this in a very uh, computational way, um, quantitative way, we can get error bars and we can use statistics, statistics, um, to actually determine which models are better given that they have different numbers of free parameters in them. And using that methodology, we find that cycloids uh, support a model with obliquity, a model with obliquity and physical libration, and rotation from non-synchronous rotation. However, our title, or our fits do not support fast spin pull precession, and they do not support stress from non-synchronous rotation. So these are the obliquity values that were indicated by our fits. So this is with the obliquity model, this is with obliquity plus physical libration. And we get basically similar values, um, but one thing we notice is that each, each cycloid, so each dot on here, um, is different. That indicates that each cycloid formed with a different obliquity value. So the other thing you need to know here is that the error bars are on here. They're within the size of these icons. And so what that tells us is that to very high confidence, each cycloid uh, fit does correspond to a different obliquity. And so that tells us uh, that we have time variable obliquity values um, that are all about one or less. And that's consistent with the expectations from Bills et al. for a Europa that has a global ocean. So longitude migration uh, from non-synchronous rotation is indicated in our fits, even though the stress is not. And so here I've shown uh, how much longitude migration we would need for each fit. And all we know from this is that you still need longitude migration, even though we're fitting things much, much better. Uh, and so it's possible that we're seeing confirmation of Goldreich and Mitchell, that you do get rotation, but it limits the amount of stress that can build up. Or maybe we're missing some other tidal component that would allow us to fit things where they are. Finally, libration amplitudes vary from 0.71 to 2.44 degrees. Now, that is a lot larger than what we expected from our theory. We also find that, like the obliquity, each cycloid has a different libration amplitude, which indicates temporal variability. And that's also something that was not uh, expected from theory. Um, so the good news is that if the libration amplitude is really this big, we might be able to observe it with Earth-based radar. Uh, the bad news is we wouldn't expect it to be that big. Uh, we do notice that the phases, the libration phases, cluster around zero degrees, which means it's in phase with the eccentricity. And one thing I'll point out here is that physical libration and longitude migration both alter the longitudinal pattern of tidal stress that a cycloid would, would propagate through. And so it's possible that the fact that we're getting strange answers in both of these cases indicates that we're missing a, a longitudinal contribution uh, to, the, to the tidal stress. But maybe I'm right. It could just be right. <laughs>
All right, so to summarize the implications for Europa's rotation, we see that Europa has a time-varying obliquity of about one degree. Europa's spin pole precesses slowly with respect to individual cycloid formation, but quickly with respect to the geologic time scale. I say that because each cycloid we test has a different spin pole direction, but within one cycloid, we don't see evidence of, of the spin pole changing. Um, Europa librates with an amplitude of one to two degrees in phase with the eccentricity libration. Europa's ice shell rotates non-synchronously, and the rotation of the ice shell is slow enough not to induce stresses that would affect cycloid formation. Okay, so on to thing number two, which is reevaluating strike-slip fault patterns using the results that we just got in part one. So here are a couple of maps uh, that I made back, back in the day um, of strike-slip faults on Europa. And so you can see that um, there are a whole lot of them. So these, the thicker white lines are the fault, and then the thin white lines show you the offset along the fault. And so there's lots of different scales of these. This one is a little bit smaller. This guy up here actually has an offset of 80 kilometers, so quite significant. Uh, and I actually mapped all of these in all of the Galileo regional mapping images um, and found 192 faults. And this is one of the ways that we uh, display that data. So here's longitude and latitude. And then in each of these bubbles, we've sort of binned the data to that latitude and longitude. And we've shown the azimuth of the observed fault um, by the azimuth of this line. And then the last piece of information you, you get here is that red faults are left lateral, like these, and blue faults are right lateral. And that indicates the slip direction on the fault. And uh, just as one final point, um, most of these white circles are places where we didn't have data of the same uh, resolution. But the, the, the empty guys here are actually due to chaotic terrain that just destroyed any history. And so we can't actually find faults in that region. Um, so when we squint at this, we, we see a pattern here, which is that up here in the north, we get only right lateral faults, only red. And then when we move, we look a little further south, we get an, a mixed region, right and left lateral faults. Uh, but in this bottom region, we get almost you know, overwhelmingly more uh, right lateral faults, blue faults. In this hemisphere, the statistics are slightly different. We still get some you know, left lateral faults in the north, but there's only two of them. Um, then we get a mixture that actually extends all the way into the southern hemisphere. And we have our one you know, left later, or right lateral only uh, region down here. So we want to keep this pattern in mind uh, when we're looking at tidal models and mechanical models for strike slip formation, because we want to be able to match these patterns. So there's a model for uh, strike slip formation called tidal walking. It's been around for quite some time. And the basic idea is that you have uh, a fault in the ice. Um, when tension opens the crack, you are free to slip. When tension closes the crack, you cannot slip backwards. So even though you have cyclic stresses, you can only slip in one direction. Um, and that's what we're showing here. This is time in the orbit, and then the stress on the y-axis, where we've defined positive stress as tension or left lateral shear, and negative stress as compression or right lateral shear. So what happens here, point A, uh, the fault goes into tension, and so uh, the fault opens and creates an initial right lateral slip. Over time, the shear stress on the fault is decreasing, so the elastic nature of Europa's ice shell actually acts to pull this fault right back into alignment, such that when the shear stress, this gray line, crosses zero at B, there's no displacement on the fault at all. Then you start increasing the left lateral shear stress on the fault, creating left lateral displacement. And at C, the normal stress closes the fault, and you're left with a left lateral offset on the fault. Uh, and then we hand wave and say that we assume during the dormant phase, during the locked phase of this fault, there's some hysteresis, some stress is lost. And that way, when you reopen the fault in the next orbit, when you get back to point A, um, you don't actually give back all of the slip that you accrued during the initial orbit. So this is the model. And we can use this model to predict slip directions on Europa. And so here, again, we have longitude and we have latitude. And so the way you read this plot is that, say you're looking at something within this location, a 45 degree crack would be predicted to be left lateral, which is black. Whereas, you know, 
its sort of complement over here would be considered right lateral. And what we see, this is using tidal walking and also for an eccentricity only model. And what we see when I overlay those regions that defined our pattern, we don't see that pattern in, in, this, uh, in this prediction chart. Like you get left lateral in the fault, you left lateral in the north, you get right lateral in the south, you get a mixture across the equator. But in our pattern, we actually see those offset. This is supposed to be in the mixed region, this is supposed to be in the mixed region. So we're not really seeing kind of what we would expect to see. When we add obliquity, we break symmetry and we alter where those regions are. So now we can see that there, there are areas, longitudes, where you do get exclusively right lateral faults in the south, but there are also longitudes at which you get mixed regions of faults. And so now when we overlay our predictions, it's not perfect, but we're starting to get a better fit uh, where in the, the leading hemisphere, we're seeing you know, a mixture that goes further south. In the trailing hemisphere, we're seeing a mixture that's further north, more in line with our observations. And actually, we, we find that strike slip patterns are more consistent with obliquity than slow polar wander, which was the initial interpretation for why, why those patterns are different in the leading and trailing hemispheres. We also find that some long, longitude migration, again, does improve the predictions, but it can be limited. Uh, so I've, I've given you the two cases here. First, with one degree of obliquity, we can fit 90% of faults with less than 90 degrees of longitude migration. Um, in order to fit all the faults, we have to bump it up to 1.2 degrees of obliquity, and we have to move things quite a bit. Um, now, we know that obliquity changes with time, so I would conclude from this that the obliquity is probably about one degree, maybe with the maximum departure at 1.2 degrees in order to fit all of these faults. Uh, we also found that physical libration only improved fits if you also assumed fast precession. We don't really see evidence for fast precession, so I don't think that physical libration is really well supported with this model. Um, and we find that non-synchronous rotation has to be slow relative to strike slip formation times. And the reason is, we see two distinct populations, one at tr in the trailing hemisphere, one in the leading hemisphere. If the surface was moving quickly and things were forming sort of slowly, then you should see uh, basically the same populations in both hemispheres. Um, and this corresponds well to our idea that you know, the rotation is slow, it's not generating stress. OK, so I told you this is what we found with tidal walking. However, tidal walking is really just a conceptual idea. It's not a mechanical model. And so the third part of my work has been to develop a more mechanical model for how strike slips form in Europa's surface. And so the goal is to develop a linear elastic formulation um, to explain strike slip formation on Europa. We want it to include stress release due to slip and stress relaxation. We want to use a Coulomb failure criterion to determine when slip will occur. We want to calculate the cumulative slip and make predictions of slip direction over many orbits. And we're calling this model shell tectonics. Um, and then the last step will be to test our model of shell tectonics by comparing it with these patterns of observed faults, just like we did with tidal walking, and see if we can actually generate uh, faults. So when we think about strike slip on Europa, we have to be careful about what we're talking about, because we're used to thinking of plate tectonics, which is this cartoon, right? So when you get two plates, you're moving them past each other, uh, they're happy to move. If you suddenly shut off plate tectonics, they wouldn't move back. They would stop. Um, but on Europa, we have an elastic shell, and we have a fracture in the middle of the shell. And so when you, when you uh, cause slip in the shell, it actually stores elastic energy in the shell that acts to want to bring you back to, to the beginning. And so you can envision this by thinking of plates that are actually attached at the far field by a spring. And so that spring is going to pull them back uh, if, you, if you were to release the stress on them. And so we have to keep this in mind when we're developing the model. So our linear elastic formulation uh, includes this as the governing equation, which um, relates the accumulated stress on the fault to the tidal stress and also um, the am amount of relaxation on the fault. And then we determine that slip occurs if the fault is in tension. So just like with tidal walking, if the fault is open, you know, if it's in tension, it's free to slip. But also, if the fault is in compression, we still allow it to slip if it it exceeds the, if the shear stress exceeds the Coulomb failure criterion, which I've shown here. So if we have a slip event, 
we immediately set the stress on that fault to be zero, and then the stress has to begin accumulating on the fault once again. Um, and we increment the slip. Um, so we sum cumulative slip throughout the orbit, and then determine the slip direction based on the average offset over 1,000 orbits. So every orbit, you're getting a little bit of slip. We average this over many, 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 many orbits. Um, if the number is positive, it's a left lateral fault. If it's negative, it's a right lateral fault. And so here's what is actually a little busy looking plot, uh, but we'll go through it. So on x-axis, we have time in fractions of an orbit. This is actually over three orbits. And again, stress on the y-axis. We're showing four lines here. Red is the Coulomb failure envelope. Uh, purple is the accumulated shear stress on the fault. Brown, which is this color, <laughs> is the cumulative slip. And then gray is the trend of the offset. So what we're looking at here is in this region, during this time period, the stress is in tension. So the fault is open, it's free to slip. And so as, so the accumulated stress on the fault is zero. It's, it's slipping, so it's releasing stress every time. So you're not accumulating stress. What you are accumulating is slip. And so we see that the cumulative slip line um, is changing. Then when we get to this point, we've entered the compressive phase of Europa's orbit. So now the fault is closed. And so the stress just accumulates on this fault as time passes until eventually it hits the Coulomb failure envelope. So that means it's reached the failure criterion. So the fault slips, all the stress is relieved, and you see a big change in the amount of slip on the fault. And so we see two kinds of behavior on this fault now. We see continuous slip, which are these small slip events that basically just occur continuously. And then we see these large events that are spaced in time. And then we've drawn in, at the exact same point in the orbit, this line. And it shows that you get a positive trend. And what that means is that every time we complete one orbit, we're leaving some amount of positive slip on the fault, which is left lateral slip. And so over time, we accumulate a left lateral offset on this fault. So this is the shell tectonics model. So what does it predict? Well, without eccentricity, with Yes, without, ex without obliquity, with just eccentricity, we get a similar picture to what we had before, where we have a dominant uh, left lateral fault forming in the north, right lateral fault forming in the south with a mixture across the equator. And now if we add obliquity, similar to what we got with tidal walking, um, you do see this uh, break in the symmetry where you can move the mixed region north in one hemisphere and south in the other. And to remind you, I'll overlay the patterns. And now we get actually a really good fit where we do see almost exclusively uh, right lateral faults here in the south, um, mixed region right where we would expect it, and then left lateral only. And the same is true in the trailing hemisphere. And it turns out that 75% of the faults in the survey uh, can be fit at their current locations with this model. So now I'm going to zoom in right here on these three guys and tell you about something else we get with shell tectonics that we don't get with tidal walking. And that is how much offset accumulates per orbit. Since we're calculating the slip, we, we can get that number out. And so for each of those three bubbles here, you can see, again, black is left lateral and right is, uh, gray is right lateral. In these bubbles, though, we're showing how quickly, stress, or how quickly slip accumulates on those faults based on their azimuth. And so you can see in this region, uh, these reddish, the darker red regions are azimuths that would build slip very, very quickly. Now, if you imagine you're looking at an image of Europa, and you have two faults, they're the same age, and one of them accrues slip very fast compared to the other, you're much more likely to identify the, the fast slip feature because it's going to have more slip on it. And so here in the center of these plots, of these bubbles, we show the actual observations. And you see that in this region, those observations trend east-west, uh, just like the region of fastest accumulation rate. And we don't see much at all in the rest of these regions. And so there are places where this looks really good. Right here, the, the red lines correspond really nicely to the, the bright red. Um, but there are also places where it doesn't work at all. Uh, these blue lines are obviously being predicted to go the other direction. So that doesn't work so well. So we're still analyzing uh, this data to determine if the correlation that we sort of see when we squint um, represents a real correlation. So the results uh, we find is that shell tectonics can reproduce strike slip fault patterns. Um, and we think that explicitly including the drop in stress due to slip 
is, uh, is an important part of this. We also tested a plate tectonics formulation, um, so without the spring. And we found that it predicts equal numbers of left lateral and right lateral faults at all locations on Europa, which is contrary to what we see. We find that obliquity can alter the leading and trailing populations um, the way that we would expect for our observations. And again, 75% of faults can be fit at their current locations in this model. And this is still preliminary. Uh, observed fault azimuths do seem to correlate with uh, azimuths of sort of the fast slippers. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about is how else we can use all these wonderful things that I spent years and years doing. So here's a, an image of a very interesting cycloid. comes through right here. And we see that instead of just having one cusp, it seems to have three cusps. Why is that? Well, we don't know. But if we understood how that formed, we might understand more about the mechanics of strike-slip fault formation, of uh, cycloid formation. And so one of the things we'd sure like to know when coming up with a formation model is whether these guys split this direction or split no, this direction. Okay, so, so we want to know that. And I mentioned earlier that without obliquity, you can just look at a cycloid and say, well, this is how it propagated. So you could just look at the cycloid and say, well, this thing went this direction or this direction. I don't know for this particular one. And so I went and mapped all of these. I found a whole bunch of them. And I looked at which direction you find them on cycloids. And I found that, sadly, 16 of them branch from one side and seven branch from the other. Well, that made it really hard to come up with a consistent formation mechanism. But when we add obliquity, we break the symmetry. We can't use that rule anymore. And so it's possible that there is one direction that works for all of these faults. So now my job will be to model cycloids that have these little guys on them, figure out which direction is most likely, and that will allow me to come up with a formation mechanism for what I call branch cusps, these cusps. And that will hopefully inform our cycloid formation mechanisms as well. So a second thing that I'm working on right now is thinking about tides on Europa raised by Io. Now, the first thing you probably think when you think of tides raised by Io is, well, those don't matter. Because Jupiter is so, so big, and the, t the tides raised by Jupiter are going to dominate anything el else that happens. But we have to remember that the reason Jupiter creates stress on Europa isn't because it, pu it pulls up a big tide. It's because that tide changes a very small amount throughout the day due to eccentricity. So for Io to have an effect, the little amount that Io changes Europa's shape throughout the day that change has to be comparable to the change in the shape raised by Jupiter. And when we, when we look at this, we find that it's actually Io's tidal contribution is about 2% that of Jupiter, which is much bigger than we'd expect just looking at the size of Io versus the size of Jupiter. And here I've shown uh, the beginnings of this work, looking at uh, contours of how much the stress changes when you add Io. And uh, you can see that there are regions where you actually get uh, a pretty high change. Um, now, this work only includes eccentricity so far, um, but we next want to add obliquity uh, because the direction of Jupiter and the direction of Io will change, so you'll get a different latitudinal libration of the tidal bulge, and also the influence of Ganymede, which is a much bigger moon. And then finally, Enceladus. So these, this is the south pole of Enceladus, and we see uh, these four long fractures called the tiger stripes. And this one, Cairo, looks eerily similar to a cycloid shape that we see on Europa. And these uh, tiger stripes have been linked to uh, plume sources, which is shown here, and also to enhanced heating, uh, maybe coming out. And this is Cairo right here. And so here I'm showing our preliminary fit to Cairo using the same kind of tidal tectonic model that I used to fit cycloids uh, on Europa. Um, so with that, I will take questions. <laughs> Alyssa, can you just um, uh, let us know what the difference is between the non-synchronous rotation and the uh, longitudinal rotation, uh, and uh, and what what importance they have on an, on Europa? Right. So they're the same thing, basically. So you have a shell. The shell is turning slowly relative to some point on Europa. We call that non-synchronous rotation of the shell. And that has potentially two effects. One, it moves things from the latitude and longitude grid that we, we've painted on Europa. It moves things relative to that latitude and longitude grid. So when we observe something, 
it turns out it may have formed somewhere else in the stress field and then migrated. The second thing it can do is it could generate stress. So the fact that the shell is moving can generate stresses. And it turns out that we see a lot of evidence for things moving in longitude. So that non-synchronous rotation is occurring. But we don't see a lot of evidence or support for stress being generated by that process. And that can happen if you rotate slowly enough. If you rotate slowly enough, things like viscous flow and other effects can actually compensate for the stress that would have otherwise been generated. Tidal bulges that develop in Europe aren't going to oppose that enough to stop it or? Uh, well, that's a happen. tricky question. I mean, the idea is that as you're moving this shell, you're moving different, different surface features over those bulges. And so, but how the bulges actually influence the ability <laughs> of the shell to rotate, that's Goldreich and Mitchell. And that's, uh, th their model suggests that it's hard to it's hard to do that. It's hard to move the shell over bulges. And so uh, you have to have it be a slow process and kind of let things happen. But I shouldn't speak for them. Should look to that paper for more details. Thank you. That, that was really interesting. And, and it's roused in my mind a problem I've been having ever since the first cycloid explanation came up. This is at the, you know, the freshman level, not at your calculations. Since the periodicity of the cycloid is just a ro one rotation a day, and yet the surface may be millions of years old, how often does a cycloid form? Or how old are the cycloids? Or why is only a few days out of hundreds of thousands of years that one happens? That's a really, really good question. Um, and we don't have the exact answer to that question yet. Uh, but you're right. We would expect that if it's easy to make cycloids, we should see cycloids everywhere. And we don't. We do see cycloids throughout uh, the sort of sequence of, of activity on Europa. So we can find little cusps where everything but that little cusp has been, you know, destroyed. Um, but I would say what seems to be the most likely answer is that when you fracture the surface, you relieve stress. You alter the, the pattern of stress in that region. And so if you have one big long crack that propagates through a region, you may not create another crack in, in that vicinity for a very long time. Now, what causes a crack to shut off? We don't know. What, how far away is it before you form another crack? We don't know. Uh, but those are, are interesting questions of current research. Is there any information? Can you deduce the relative ages of cracks? Um, sometimes. Uh, so you have to have a cycloid cross another cycloid in order to get those sort of temporal uh, you know, indicators. And for the features that we selected, we had to select ones that are easy to model. And that means ones with big, wide arcs so that you can't just draw a line through it and get a good answer. Um, and unfortunately, from the ones that we picked, we get this one's older than that one. And on the other side of Europa, this one's older than that one. And that's it. And you can't get a sequence out of that. But if we had better imagery, uh, we could probably start to back out some more of those sequences. Hi. Um, does the fact that your models uh, and the preliminary application to Enceladus uh, is looking good, does that imply a subsurface ocean on Enceladus? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you, I would say you would at least need a local ocean, if not a global ocean, because you can't, you can't get the same tidal response from the shell if it's a thick shell with no, no ocean. Uh, so, yes, I would say it leans toward that interpretation. Go back to Dave's freshman level kind of yes. question. What's the mean number of arcs in a cyclite? Ooh, I don't know if I know that off the top of my head. Um, the problem is, how do you know it's a cycloid if it only has one arc? Right? So you're already skewed toward observing things that have many arcs. Um, but I would say... Right, so I would say uh, the max is about 10 to 15 from the things that we've seen. Um, more of them are, are usually like 3 to 5. Uh, but you also have the problem that things tend to propagate out of our best imagery. And that makes it kind of hard to follow them all the time. Um, I would also say, though, that it doesn't mean they can't form 50 arcs. It means that we can't track. 50 arcs across the surface. So you could imagine that you form this beautiful 
beautiful long cycloid with many, many arcs, and then subsequent geologic activity just wipes out portions of them. So you see three with five or, or some other fraction. Hi, if um, the shell can slip in longitude, uh, how about latitude? Any possibility of polar wander or something like that? Yeah, so, so I have two comments about polar wander. So the first is that, um, that we actually interpreted strike slip faults originally as polar wander. So because they, didn't, they weren't symmetric across the equator, we said, ah, oh, the whole thing is tilted. Um, and it's a plausible idea. It's not necessary, it turns out. Um, but it, it can happen. Um, and then there was a recent paper by, I think, Paul Schenk, where he suggested that there were some very, very old features on Europa that indicated that you had had a polar wonder event. Um, that's not in conflict with what I've done because my work is based on really new features. Strikes the faults that we observe easily have been there not as long as the features that Paul is talking about. Um, but certainly polar wonder is, is possible. Um, I don't see any need to invoke it yet. Oh, um, <clears throat> my question is about one of those early charts that showed a puddle, and mm -hmm. it looked like in the middle of that puddle was a crater. Um, do you, can you tell us a little about that? Um, it's not my field. Um, so we interpret those puddles as being related in some way to chaos features, um, and chaos features are highly debated. Um, there's a few different models for how they form. One is a melt-through model, this idea that water from the base of the shell somehow is, is melting out a portion of it. And so that for the puddle, maybe you get some kind of subsistence and you're eliminating uh, the tectonic terrain that was on it before. Um, other models are that if you have a thick, thick ice layer, you have convection in the warm part of the ice and that has a similar mechanism. Um, so those are some of the ideas. Uh, but if you have a great model for chaos formation, that, that's something people would want. Yes, that's what the, so when you actually disaggregate um, the regions, so I can go back to that. So figure. when you disaggregate terrain into blocks like this, you, you, we call that a chaos feature. And you can see some smaller features that are similar. Here's a little raft floating in that. Uh, and this puddle we think is sort of genetically related to chaos features, maybe some early stage or failed attempt at chaos. I guess this is actually also chaotic terrain with <coughs> rafts up tilted. Um, and so yeah, there are a lot of ideas about how these form, but I have yet to see one that really nails it. Yes. Um, forgive me for another freshman no, it's question, fine. but uh, way back in the beginning, you showed the core stress equations of your yes. simulations, and uh, there's some parameters there that describe the shell uh, characteristics, and I'm just curious, um, you know, how do you, do we know enough about the shell thickness, the material, the you know the, the modulus elasticity, the things that you right. mentioned there. I'm just curious where are those came. You're talking from? about the these guys the lower down left here. Hand. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the first thing I'll say is we don't know a lot about ice at the temperatures relevant to Europa. We don't know a lot about ice that may be porous at the top or that's being sort of systematically flexed over many, many uh, millions of years. So n no, we don't know very well. Um, however. I can get away with this because this constant is going to just be a constant term in all of my stresses. So if you changed one of those numbers by some amount, you would change the, all of the stress magnitudes equally, and so you'd get basically the same answer. Um, thickness of the shell is well, the thickness of the shell is actually not something that's included in here. There is no term that tells you specifically the thickness of the shell. As long as the shell uh, is thin relative to the radius of Europa, which it certainly is, um, these work. Um, unfortunately, that also means you can't back out the thickness of the shell from modeling cycloids. Yeah, everybody wants me to do that. I, I can't do it. <laughs> okay, if you have any further questions, I'd encourage you to come up and sp uh, speak to, the, uh, to Alyssa afterwards. And we have uh, a special memento Aww. of your talk, which is a, uh, a setting mug for you. So, will you join me all in thanking Alyssa for a great talk? <laughs>